Don't read the comments. It will spoil a very beautiful ending. This is an interesting pair of identical twins. Nathan was a born again Christian. He loved God. He loved reading his Bible and everyone knew him as a really nice family man. But his brother Nigel on the other hand was the complete opposite. Mm. Nigel was loud. He was obnoxious and he often found himself in trouble with the police. One night, Nigel is playing pool in a bar when he accuses the man who he's playing pool with of cheating. The man is adamant, what? saying there's no way I've cheated, I've played fairly the whole game. And so Nigel began to get angry. He pushed the man and the man retaliated. He picked up his pool cue and he slammed it on Nigel's head. The men then started to exchange blow after blow for what felt like a lifetime until eventually Nigel pulled back his fist and he slammed a punch into the other man's jaw, knocking him out cold. Strangely, there was actually a doctor who was in the bar that evening and he ran over to the man that Nigel had just punched and checked him over. And to his disbelief, he found that the man was no longer breathing. Nigel began to panic and he ran out of the bar covered in blood and he ran to the only place he felt he could go. He ran to his twin brother Nathan's house. Nathan, Nathan, I've drank too much again and I've punched a man and I believe that I've ended his life. Nigel, Nigel, calm down, said Nathan. Here, take my clean white shirt and I want you to go upstairs and have a shower. Give me your shirt and listen, when the police come, I'll deal with them. So that's exactly what Nigel went to do. He washed the blood off himself in the shower and whilst he was in the shower, the police knocked on the door. Nathan answered the door, but what was he wearing? He was wearing Nigel's blood-stained shirt. Nigel Smith, we are arresting you on suspicion of. And Nathan, silently and willingly, allowed the police to arrest him and he would later pay the price for his twin brother's crimes. I've got to ask you now, do you think that was fair. I mean, what goes through your mind as you hear that story? You've probably heard Christians talk about something called the gospel, but what is the gospel? Well, just like Nigel had a person who stood in his place, who silently went away to take the punishment for his crimes, so you and I have someone who stood in our place. Okay, perhaps we've not committed crimes like Nigel has, but every single one of us has tried to run the show. Every single one of us has done things that we're not proud of. Every single one of us has rebelled against God and the Bible calls this sin. So who is this person who stood in our place? Well this person is Jesus Christ and the Bible uses a beautiful picture of Jesus. It describes Jesus like a lamb. Now listen to it. He was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was like a quiet, gentle lamb and he suffered a dreadful death in our place. He didn't complain, he didn't shout, he didn't stop, although he had so much power that he could have called an army of angels to stop it at any moment. Yet silently, he endured the punishment for our sin. I don't think I've ever told you this before, but my favorite verse in all of the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. What does it say? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might inherit the righteousness of God. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to our plot twist in our story. Nigel takes Nathan's shirt and Nathan gives Nigel his clean shirt. And that's pretty much the central message of the gospel. Here we are. We are wearing a dirty shirt. It's disgusting. It's covered in the stains of sin and everyone can see that we're unclean. Everyone can see that we deserve to be punished. But Jesus says, here, take my shirt, my clean, righteous shirt, and put it on. Go and wash yourself. Go and have a shower in my forgiveness. Be cleansed, be clean. Put on my clean shirt, and I will wear your filthy garments. And on the cross, Jesus really did wear our filthy garments. He was clothed in our sin, so that God the Father on the cross could deal with our sin, and he punished 
punished Jesus there. He poured out his wrath there. There was darkness over all of the land when Jesus died in our place. And there, justice, judgment was satisfied because our sin was dealt with. But Jesus, remember, gives us his righteous, clean garment. So God doesn't see Joe's past, Joe's shame, Joe's guiltiness. He doesn't see your shame, your past, your guiltiness. He sees Christ. When a man or woman puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when they put on Christ and they wear those clean garments, is all God sees is his son. And remember who his son is. This is the one who made blind men see. This is the one who could turn water into wine. This is the one who fed 5,000. This is the one who healed the sick, who loved the poor, who taught amazing things. So Christ Jesus' perfect track record is attributed to filthy sinners like you and me. Isn't that amazing news? And that is why it's called the gospel. That not only are our sins forgiven, but our sins are forgotten. Okay, now I am not here to bash anyone else's religion. I'm not here to put down anyone else's beliefs. But I know some of you will be asking this question right now. What's the difference? What's the difference between Christianity and Islam? What's the difference between Christianity and Hinduism? What's the difference between a Christian and a Buddhist? What is the difference, Joe? I'll tell you, there are two very distinct differences. The first one is this. Jesus Christ was God in a flesh. Jesus Christ was very, very special. He did something that no man, no woman has ever done before. Yes, every single one of us dies. You know that. Anyone who's got a skin, anyone who's got a heartbeat will one day go into a grave and will die. But Jesus Christ, he also died just like you and I. He went into a grave, but he did something very, very interesting. On the third day, after being put inside this tomb, Christ rose from the dead. I don't know anyone else in the world who's ever done that. And if you know someone who has risen from the grave, and there's true evidence, just like there's a heap of evidence towards the Lord Jesus Christ rising from the dead, if you can show me that, well then I'll put my trust in that person. And then the second difference is this. Every other religion says you can curry up the favour of God by doing good works. If you do this and do that, well then, yes, I think you will likely get a place in heaven. Or perhaps you'll get to Nirvana. But what does Christianity say? Don't do anything. Do nothing. It's already been done at the cross. And that is what all of this video is about. This one word beginning with G. What is the word I'm talking about? Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. But hello, I know exactly what some of my religious friends will say right now. They will say, how is that fair? That just gives you a free license to sin. That just gives you permission to go on and do what you like because Jesus died for your sins. You've got a free pass now. What's to stop Nigel from not going out another night and committing the exact same crime? Well, if you think like this, you have to hear this true story because I think it will change your mind. I want to introduce you to the first Queen Elizabeth of England. She reigned between the years 1558 and 1603. And during that time, there was actually a number of assassinations that took place against her life. One is rather fascinating. You see, there was a young woman and she wanted to take out the queen. So somehow she managed to get hold of a male servant's garments, a male servant's uniform, and she dressed herself in this. She then snuck into the palace and once in the palace, she found Queen Elizabeth's bedroom and hid herself in the wardrobe. Now, what this woman didn't realise is that Queen Elizabeth's guards were very diligent. They checked every nook, every cranny to make sure the room was safe for the Queen to enter. And so what did they find as they opened the wardrobe? They found that young woman holding a small sword ready to assassinate the Queen. The young woman, knowing that her case was hopeless, flung herself at the feet of Queen Elizabeth and cried out, please have mercy on me. But the queen looked at the young woman rather coldly and said, if I show you grace, what will you do for me in return? And this would be assassin. And remember now, she's at the feet of the queen. She responds rather boldly and says, but your majesty, if grace 
has conditions attached to it, then it's not grace at all. And this actually touched Queen Elizabeth's heart, and she said, you're right, by grace I pardon you. And apparently, this young woman then became a servant of the Queen. And not just any servant, she was known as the most loyal, the most devoted, the most faithful servant in all of the palace. And my dear friend, that is what grace does to the heart. When there's no conditions attached to it, when it's totally free, it transforms us, it changes us, where we say, I have been forgiven of a great debt. My sins have been washed away. God has saved me and asked for nothing in return. So now I want to serve him with all that I have. Not because it will give me a place in heaven, but just out of gratitude to say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I really do hope that there's someone out there right now for the first time ever finally understanding the grace of God, that it's a free gift, that it's totally free and it's all there in the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you, if you believe this message right now was speaking just to you, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you right now to sit there quietly, close your eyes and call out to the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. Just like that woman fell at the Queen's feet and asked for mercy, that's all you have to do is ask for mercy and the God who hears all things will answer your prayer immediately. You might think I'm a horrible person. You might think I'm hopeless. No one could love me. But I want to tell you that God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he's ready to forgive you, to save you, and to make you into one of his servants where you'll serve him for all of eternity in his new kingdom. But perhaps I've not done a very good job. Maybe you've still got questions about the grace of God. If that's you, please would you give me a second chance? Click here and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about.